Hey guys, this is Billy from adultchiller.com and welcome back. This is part two of my 5,000 subscriber Q&A session. Uh, I got some more questions from you guys. I'm really excited to answer them, so let's dive right in. All right, so this is from Josh. Um, as he begins, what is the best way to begin cementing the relationship of notes to fingering to aid in better sight reading? Is the answer a thousand reps? Additionally, when I bow on one string, it seems the neighboring strings jump in the way to join in. Do you have any tips? Okay, so let's start with the second part of the question. Uh, that's That happens all the time when you're first starting out is you, you're kind of bowing and then suddenly for no reason or no intentional reason, you are hitting a second string. It can be so frustrating because you just want a clean sound and you're kind of, kind of getting these extra sounds. For me, probably the biggest thing that really got in my way was not having my arm in the right position. Okay, I was obsessed with my hand, I got really into my fingers, but I never, for not never, but for a long time, I kind of disregarded how helpful it is to have your elbow in the right place. In terms of height okay so if if I'm gonna play on the D string and my elbow gets too low as I pull my lower elbow is just naturally gonna first off it'll probably po pull the bow um, so that it's no longer straight uh, parallel to the bridge but on top of that it's probably gonna pull it downwards and so there's like an unintentional double stop that's created um, same thing if you if you raise your elbow too much as you pull on the D string, you you can very easily because your arm's coming up, the tip of the bow is going down, and that's it's very easy for it first off again to not become straight um, to the bridge, so that's going to affect the sound quality. But then also it's going to hit another string. So first thing is make sure your arm is at the right height for each string. Second thing is practice tracing the bow against so what I do is I put the hair of the bow literally the hair onto the bridge itself okay and then I would look in a mirror and just pull there won't be any sound because your bow is literally on the bridge but you're just tracing the bridge with the hair and that will show you kind of and talk about parallel to the bridge you're right on top of the bridge so that will show you what a straight bow is kind of where your arm ends up it, for me, on my journey, I always had this kind of mentality of kind of pulling into into myself, almost like a, a rowing motion like this. And it, especially on the D and the A string, the solution more often than not was my arm moving away from my body in the second half of the bow. Okay, the first half would usually be okay. But then as I got here, I just kind of continued what I thought was a straight line and then the tips going like this. So pull straight and then the second half from the middle part on, it's kind of your form extending. Okay, so it's kind of a, it's two, it's like a hinge, kind of a hinging job there. All right, so that's the first thing I would say. Um, and then, so relationship of notes to fingering to aid better sight reading. Okay, so I think there's two things going on here. The first is being able to read bass clef notes like instantly. That's its own skill. So that's like, you see, you know, you go F, A flat, G sharp, you know, boom, boom, boom. You can just say them right away. That you can do with flashcards. The reason that's important is that is part of the puzzle. <laughs> is being able to, okay, what, what is that note, okay? The other one is the fingering. That gets a little more complicated. In the very beginning, you're usually gonna just stay in first position. So you get used to, you know, let's say D sharp on the, I'm uh, sorry, F sharp on the D string. In the very beginning, I always thought third, third finger because I, in first position, it's always third finger. You'll find as you learn to shift around that you can play the same exact note on the same exact string with different fingers in different positions. So that kind of slows things down to a degree. I got to the point where my sight reading was so slow 
that I literally wrote a number over every note in the piece. Even if it was repeated over and over, I just like 3030303. It's, you think I'd see that it's the exact same two notes going back and forth. Just put a number over everything. That worked to a degree, but it really bit me in the ass when I eventually, you know, went to my first uh, community. It was a school orchestra. I had gone back to school to study cello, and I was just used to putting fingerings all over the place. And now I have a shared part, and I can't do that. So it was very sobering because it's like, oh, I better, I really need to, my sight reading, like, what is this note? And then, you know, how, what finger am I going to play it with? Okay. Scales will help for sure. Um, etudes will help a lot of it. Like you said, a thousand reps. Yeah, that, that will help <laughs> the more experience you have, but I make sure that you really read the notes quickly, just bass notes and, and you know exactly what note it is right away. If it takes even a split second, that's something you can really improve quickly with flashcards, and that will that will up your your game quickly because you're you're not like okay not only what fingering but like what note is that you don't want to be there okay that's my answer I hope that helps all right this is Pat J I quit due to frustration with sound quality okay getting back into it after six years off uh, my question is how do you make the sound connected between notes and phrases versus choppy sounding. I understand about smooth bow changes and thinking about beginning and ends of notes, but I can never seem to do it and nothing sounds connected. Also, can you learn musicality? As you listen back, you don't feel like it sounds very musical when you're playing and like kind of like you're just playing the notes. Um, you feel like you're playing the dynamics, but you don't actually hear them on playback. Oh, I was there. I have a story about that. I see others progress and see they eventually sound connected, but after six years, it's not really happening. Okay, so just real quick, I uh, was having a rehearsal with a pianist. We were in the same class together at the junior college. I'd gone back to school. Um, I've only been playing about a year and a half, and we're playing a Beethoven sonata. Somehow, I figured out how to kind of play the notes to this Beethoven sonata, and he's asked me, like, should we do a crescendo here or a day crescendo? What do you think? And I said, well, let's try both. And he's like, okay, let me just listen to you and then I'll try and match it. And I do the first one, huge crescendo in my head. And he goes, okay, which one was that? He literally couldn't tell if I was trying to get louder or softer because that's how little bow control I had. I thought in my head, it was just like, I, I was like hoping the roof wouldn't fall in on us because it was so booming and enormous and it, nothing coming out of the cello even remotely close to that. So part of that is technique. Um, just, the, you know, bow, basically figuring out like what can I do with the bow to make a crescendo, like for dynamics wise, um, you know, using speed, you know, very, making sure you vary the speed. I think a lot of earlier on in the journey, it's very easy to be correct all the time. And that includes having just, um, like just kind of a nothing wrong with that but each note is like the exact same level so if I'm trying to do a crescendo it's you know you're not hearing stuff because I'm doing the same weight and the same speed at all times so not you know nothing's different now if I if I suddenly start slower and I do, you know, tremendous difference in speed, you get more effects. So part of it could be that. Um, in terms of learning musicality, that's a great question because it brings up a question is like, do you need to learn musicality or is it just not coming through the cello? So one thing you could do to test it would be, if you're willing to do this, uh, take a melody you're trying to learn on cello and then kind of sing it. Just sing the melody into your phone and see what your voice is doing. Does your voice sound as, let's call it robotic, as your bowing normally does? If not, that means you have musicality in you, a kind of a natural singing musicality, but it's just not coming through the cello. That, that happens with a lot of people. If you find that your voice is kind of robotic, there is still plenty you can do to learn musicality. It, it comes into, I think developing your 
listening and that would be mainly off the instrument at first if that's where you feel like you are it's more listening to other players oh that was so beautiful and that's where most people who are struggling with this kind of issue most people would stop with wow that was beautiful okay why that note that they did that that person just played did it start small and get big did it start big and get small like what what craft like from a craftsmanship standpoint what did that person do to create that beautiful moment you know with these top soloists everything they do believe it or not is a choice and they could do it many many different ways but there's a single vision they have for how the sound should be and so they choose the the techniques to make that vision come to life okay so Part of it, if you hear, you know, tendencies that all these wonderful players have, your favorite players, and they have these, you know, tendencies when they're playing, you can emulate their playing to a certain degree once you develop this ability to hear what they're doing and kind of analyze it, not just from like, wow, from a kind of like passive, oh, that's amazing, just amazing. Okay, but what? What did they do? Okay. Um, in terms of connecting notes, your original, the first question, there's a couple things. With bow changes, I think the easiest way to think about it is just, I think people try to get really fancy with bow changes because we always see, you know, we see people with their, with the hand. <laughs> brush stroke that you get, you know, the kind of paintbrush technique. At the end of the day, what I think really makes a clean bow change is as little change as possible. So at one point in your in the in the stroke, the the direction of your arm has to change. That's a fact. Because you're changing bow strokes. Okay, so it's going from up bow to down bow or from down bow to up bow. Basically, if if I was going to talk about bow changes to be the the most simplistic way is that let's say you're you know going up bow and you're about to go down bow let's say i have like 10 units of weight and 10 units of speed going in one direction i want to hold that and then i want to come out of the bow change with the exact amount of weight and speed okay almost like it's a mirror and it's just like a mirror effect okay what people do i think especially early on is we, we're aware a bow change is coming and we really want it to sound smooth. So we try to kind of like lift the bow out and then restart it with like a, a gentle like finger action or something like that. All that stuff disrupts the sound. So one thing I recommend is you could try, I've done this before, this kind of barbaric grip I talk about where you basically almost, you know, like it's a baseball bat. And you can just practice um, going back and forth and just trying to make your arm as steady as possible with weight and speed. Okay, so most people, when they do it, there's just this involuntary kick when they change. And at the tip, there's an involuntary lightening of the arm and then sinking back in. Those are the kind of things that will disrupt the bow change so that it's no longer seamless. Because when you lighten up, now the sound you were making got softer. So when you start the new bow with a bigger sound, you hear da, da, da. what you want to hear is ba, da, da. and my tongue flicking is the the arm changing direction. Ba, da. That's a I mean, given the fact that we have to change the arm direction, that's as smooth as you can make it basically. And then you can eventually start using fingers to kind of airbrush that clicking da, da, so it's more of like a bubble sound like da, 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 something like that where it just kind of kind of softens the edges of that of that arm change okay i hope that helps um this might be another one to do a video on in more detail because this is a really i remember being stuck for quite a while with very audible bow changes that were often very unmusical so you are not alone. Keep working on it, and you can always email me with questions. Okay, so this is from Pooh Stevenson. I'm an adult cellist coming back to the cello after 30 years, mandolin, semi-professional level, cello. Played cello in high school and a bit in college, cool. 
I've been working very hard for a couple of years, but find it slow and arduous. Uh, what's the single best decision I made early in my journey I would recommend and do again? What was the turning point in my journey? What would you do over again if you could do it over again? Okay, let's go backwards. What would I do over again? <sighs> it's hard to say. I really liked that I was just crazy and I just like threw myself at it with reckless abandon. The issue was I never really corralled the amount of tension I was playing with and that led to a tendonitis injury that plagued me for quite a while and was a, like a true low point kind of in my life actually because I, I was so invested in cello. I, now I'm out of school, I'm ready to just like do anything I can to become a cellist. I'm trying to practice as much as possible and I have tendonitis and I had to like scale way back and rebuild my entire technique, like everything I'd done until then. So being mindful of my skeleton and thinking that, you know, there will always be a solution that's comfortable and it's worthwhile finding the comfortable solution. That, that would be the thing that if I could go back, I kind of would just throw a lot of effort at things and it's like, oh, my vibrato's a little tight. Let me just like squeeze harder and shake harder. And of course that, you know, would just narrow the vibrato even more. And then I just try, but just kind of put in effort versus use the brain <laughs> and problem solve and, and think like, okay, my hand will want to do this. It will be happy to do this for me once I get everything kind of balanced and in order. So why don't I figure out what that feels like? And then, you know, we'll be going down the right path. That was the biggest thing is probably just physical understanding and, and realizing that you want your body and the cello kind of working together and it's not going to be a struggle. That's, that's a problem if it feels like a struggle all the time. What was the turning point in my journey? There was a couple. The first one was super early on. My first teacher, I'd been playing for about three weeks and I was already practicing like a pretty good amount because I was just really into it and she said, so maybe three to maybe three to six weeks in somewhere in there she said you know you're this is pretty amazing like you could maybe be professional if you keep keep it up and i don't even know that she meant it but i just assumed she'd meant it because <laughs> i wanted to hear that secretly and that was the first turning point because i was like oh like if there's a rule against people being too old why don't i just be the exception to the rule so i don't have to like limit myself and, and uh, just this has to be a hobby. That was the first turning point because then I was like, okay, so let's, now let's indulge this like crazy, okay? Then the second one was at a certain point, I'd kind of hit a wall technically and I got access to a world, my first kind of world-class teacher and working with him just opened everything up. I mean, my God, it was scary because I, I went in there I've been playing for two years. I'm 27 and a half or whatever I was. And it's, you know, I sound like a six year old. And then, you know, he teaches at one of the top conservatories here in LA. He's not used to hearing someone at my level. And definitely I'm already like twice as old as some of his students. So it's a really bad combination, really old, really like unadvanced. But I think he saw my desire and I begged him for a second lesson. And then for, you know, the three weeks between those two lessons, I just like studied the tape I made of the lesson. Uh, and, and then that, that started me being able to come take lessons with him. I rebuilt my bow hand. I was able to get flexible fingers there. It just a whole bunch of things suddenly were possible and doable. Um, and that was a huge step forward. Other than that, it's kind of like a bunch of little aha moments and they, they just each lead up to, I guess, where I'm at today. Um, in my opinion, I'm not done. I wanna get even better. I wanna keep just riding this thing out and, and I feel like you should be able to progress your entire life just getting closer and closer to your, you know, whatever end goal, if you set it high enough, you just, there's always uh, plenty of room for improvement. I know that's true for me, but um, that I think those were, two major moments okay and then um single best decision i made early in my journey okay this this one's interesting i would say buying a really nice cello because
first off, I got it home and I opened up the case and I was like, what did I just do? Like, this is so expensive. What did I do? What am I thinking? I've been doing this for like a month. This is nuts. You know, it was just a very, for where I was, it was a very nice cello. And it was like, oh, <laughs> like I almost expected someone to stop me from doing it. And I just, now I have this really expensive cello that motivated me because I was like, okay, I better, now I want to feel like I earned it. Like I, I'm qualified to play on this thing. So that got me really serious. It also, having a better instrument really opened up what I could do. It made it a lot easier to play so that I think helped me progress to a degree. I mean, it's true that you want to, you don't want to blame your equipment all the time like those golfers who they have a terrible swing, but they're like, ah, these, this nine iron's terrible. You know, it's like, it's your swing. But, but I will say having good equipment really, really helps. And that really helped me. Okay, here's a fun one. From Paulina, may I know how long it took for you to get perfect pitch? Does it happen gradually or all of a sudden? I don't know because I don't have perfect pitch. So <laughs> let's just first start there. Perfect pitch is the ability is like you hear a refrigerator making a hum and you can say, oh, that hum, that's like an F sharp. You can, I can, like when I hear sounds, I can just tell you what sound it is. So that's not me. What I was able to do was to improve my relative pitch, which is if I start with a sound and then they say, you know, play an interval based on that, that would, that's what I can do much better than before. Um, it's been a long, arduous process. It would have been a lot faster if I had done more ear training off of the cello. It took me a while to feel, to, to really believe that it would help because I was like, yeah, yeah, but my fingers are playing the notes. Let me just, I'll just practice more. And if you if you can hear what you're supposed to do, you can make your hand go there. But for a long time when I was playing, I would just play over and over, just, you know, repeat and practice until it was, you know, quote unquote in tune to some degree. But the minute I started really analyzing my own ear and trying to improve it and hear intervals more accurately, then my intonation made a huge leap. At the end of this last session, I did the Q&A session where I talked about intonation. I talked about kind of calculating with a tuner and then sitting on the right notes and hearing it and trying to like take it in. That also in a, like later on um, was a huge help to me too because part of it was you, I can't know how to play in tune until I can hear what in tune really sounds like. So once that kind of firmed up in my ear, now if I play, say, double stops, I'm not saying I always play them in tune, but I can, I can tell when they're out of tune. And I can tell what needs to happen to put them in tune. That's everything. Okay, so I would say just training off of, you can do musictheory.net. They have a very easy little kind of interval quiz. They play two notes and you just say what the interval is. You know, you hear two sounds. Doing a lot of that really, really will help. And then, you know, it also does help playing in tune or playing with other players if you get to who play really in tune because it kind of rubs off. Problem is now you're like, I've had that in a group earlier on where I was like the one who plays kind of out of tune. So it's, I don't know how fun it is for them. It really helped me, it was amazing. Now we have another one from Gabriella. I'm a beginning player and have some questions about the bow. How important and often should the bow hair be changed? How to know the moment when you need to change the entire bow for a better one? Okay, those are two very different questions. The first one, okay, I knew someone was going to ask a question where I have to like admit something embarrassing. I don't change my hair very much. I, I know some people are just religious about it and they like every, some, some violinists I think are every like three months to six months. So cellists, I think, you know, some people Maybe soloists would change it pretty frequently. A lot of people change like once a year. I, I just don't, I don't think I've had an experience where it really seems like tremendously different. If it, unless I'm missing a bunch of hair, if the width of the hair is, is narrower because so many strings, little, I mean strings, so many hairs have broken. Yeah, it's going to help because you have more hair. But other than that, I found that opening up a new thing of rosin if I'm having trouble, that was a bigger difference for me than 
rehairing. But it's just my experience. Some people really think that a, a rehair makes a huge difference. Um, in terms of a new bow, that's a very subjective question. Um, I had one guy tell me once, because I was asking advice, he's a, a guy who plays um, professionally and he does a lot of like Hollywood movies. He's in that kind of that group of players who get hired and they play all the soundtracks for the movies. And I, I was like, what, what do you suggest for, you know, bows, instruments? And he said, get the very best stuff you can afford and just try to level up and always have basically the best equipment you could afford because it makes such a difference. So for the bow, you know, if it's your second week and you feel like the bow's not good, unless there's a problem with the bow, maybe you should just practice more. But at a certain point, like if you're a year in and you try a bow at a shop and suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, what have I been missing? It might be time to, you know, get a new bow. So it's hard to say because everyone's got their own budget and they've got all these, you know, their own concerns that influence like purchasing equipment like that. But I would say if you have a feeling that you might want a new bow, go to a shop, try bows in the price range that you're thinking of and see, just try it out and see what happens. You know, if you find something that's just night and day different, it might be time for a new bow. One little caveat, I'd be careful about trying stuff way out of your price range, price range because it, it's easy to fall in love quickly. And then suddenly, I love this bow, it's $40,000. My budget is $2,000, my budget's $500. And then you just, there's that heartbreaking moment where you just get, take it away, just, you know. So, it, I just be careful, <laughs> it's easy to fall in love. All right, this is from Ilna. I hope I said that right. Um, I have a question to add. I'm a very, very comfortable playing first position. Anything if there's notes that points, I can do it. Okay. I heard a teacher say box suites are sounding best in first position as they bring out more clarity, but I'd like to be as comfortable in other positions too. How do you read the notes to know when there's a better way to change to another position? Are there any rules for when it applies or not? Thanks. Um, it's your channel has helped me a lot. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. So, all right. Box suites. Some of the suites can be played often in first position. There's some suites that really, there's going to be a whole bunch of the notes that can't be played in first position. So, but I see what the teacher is saying, what the person is saying. And I do agree that in terms of clarity, there's a, a certain ring you get. Um, it's easier to get like a, just a very solid ring for a lot of people in first position and then you also what that also means is you're probably going to be playing with open strings and that's not a bad thing but that that does you know open strings are very clear um the issue is in my and this is all at this point now we're venturing into that subjective world of like someone's taste so i'm this is my opinion but there's it's not right or wrong it's you know, I, I like my opinion, but it's, you know, that you could have a totally different opinion and it could be equally right. Um, at a certain point, there will be times where the open string, the color of switching, if you have a big passage, let's say on the D string, and then you have to play an open A, um, there'll be times where that jars because the open A string is a different color it's a brighter color than the D strings. Something you can think about if you're picking fingerings is, again, talking about color. If you play, let's say in first position on the A string, if you, you could play those same notes, usually, <laughs> in fourth position on the D string, and you'll have a color change, and that would be like an artistic decision. So for example, the opening of the Schubert's Arpeggio Sonata, if you... <laughs> So it's, I'm pretty sure in the score it's marked piano. It's kind of a rainy day sort of sound. It's in minor. So aside from the fact that I can't vibrate that opening A, which I really want to in a piece like that by Schubert, there's also just a, a huge color change or a, a difference in color. So that would be a reason to shift into a different part of the cello the higher you go up on strings, 
and from across, not the A string, but as you, if you choose, instead of a lower position on the A string, a higher position, say on the D string to play the same notes, you're gonna have just a much warmer, rounder sound. At times that is maybe not called for, but a lot of times it, it adds a certain level of beauty to a, to a sound, especially if it's like a, you know, a sad emotion or a softer sound. You don't, you don't want something that's, you know, this, this part of first position, half position, open string on the A string, this is the brightest part of the cello. So depending on what you're doing, it's sometimes good to avoid that and just have another, other options that are, you know, warmer and softer, especially if you have a bright instrument. The overall thing with shifting is, I think the rule I think of is, first off, do I need to vibrate the note, okay? So if you need to vibrate that A, you're not gonna wanna play it as an open string because you can't really vibrate an open string. That would be the first thing. And then in terms of deciding when to shift, the rule of thumb that I learned um, and that I really enjoy is that most of the time you want to shift as little as possible so that, you know, every time you shift, there's a chance of, you know, missing the shift. It, it becomes harder. So you want to shift as little as possible. And so when you shift and when you decide to shift really depends on the notes that are, that just happened and the notes that are coming up. So it's like you need to, you're trying to grab, in my opinion, probably bigger and bigger groups of notes. And so if I can shift and now I can grab more notes without you know, playing the open string or going back and forth, that's when I would do it. Um, it's really based on the context. So one thing you can do that I, I did try is in those uh, kind of initial pieces, maybe you have that first Piotti book or you have uh, even a box suite not to perform, but just as an etude, you can try playing certain passages um, or certain like early etudes in different positions on purpose. Okay, so the Piotti, actually all of book one, except for extensions, basically stays in first position in the Piotti cello method. You could go ahead and do etude number one and shift into all these different positions playing the same notes, but just, you know, making different choices, not staying in first position. That's one way to kind of get comfortable. And it's also, it'll start showing you because like, oh, you know, if I shift now, I'm basically gonna have to shift over and over again. Um, that's another second rule I would say is ideally two shifts in a row is ideally to be avoided. And especially two shifts in a row in the same direction is, is seen as a more difficult thing to achieve. There are certain times you just have to do it, but Ideally, those are things to try to avoid. All right, so this is Famine Hill. So this might be covered in my bow hold, but just in case, I've distilled my issue into one piece of physics. I understand the concept of weight of the bow on the strings, and I understand the concept of a loose, flexible bow hand, uh, bow hold. What I don't understand is how to have enough of a bow hold without squeezing the thumb and fingers to actually transmit the weight of my arm to the strings. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I either have the depth grip on the bow, which tightens everything and forces my shoulder to get involved too much, or I have too light of a grip, seems flexible and loose, but results in a wandering bow with very thin sound. Okay. Um, I'm not, uh, okay. You are, I'm sure I'm not the only one lacking this understanding. Oh my gosh, no, definitely not. That's probably the biggest hurdle with the bow hold is figuring out what, what can we do to sink weight in, but also have a relaxed hand. So the biggest thing I'll say, I'm gonna even just, I'll put it up here, cause I don't want, you know, I, don't, I wanna get almost off cello. Cause if you just, let's just conceptualize what's going on here. So here's, here's the angle of the string, my finger. Okay, and then here's my bow hold. That's nice and relaxed. Now, if I pull, if I kind of sink in this way, into the string like this and do you see the the stick is actually meeting my finger so i'm pulling towards myself like this that that's giving me really solid contact on the string the problem is with the thumb the if the thumb starts pushing it's actually if you think about it the thumb is pushing this way it's pushing the stick away okay so one thing I used to do is I would take that kind of barbaric grip I, I talk about so frequently, and I would even hang my thumb 
off, okay? So it's off of the bow hold, and this is done only at the frog. You will drop the bow otherwise, okay? So please have a second hand ready, but just, and then you put it right on any of the strings, and then you just get used to kind of sinking in, and you your hands collapsed, you're just sinking weight into the string with your thumb off, okay? Then when that's comfortable, you try to, you know, tease maybe a couple fingers up into more of a plain position versus like just baseball bat grip. Couple, a little bit more like this, still thumbs off. Then I add the thumb and I still am collapsed and I try to sink in and have the thumb there but basically doing nothing, okay? And then if slowly after doing that, and you can pull a bow back and forth maybe a few inches just to get a feeling of kind of that heavy sticky feeling. And then I try to add the thumb, do the same thing, but everything's collapsed. I don't need any thumb if my hand is completely collapsed like this. And then eventually when the hand comes up, now the bow, now the thumb is doing the tiniest bit of work just balancing, but the majority, like the overwhelming majority of the weight is these fingers pulling, like kind of sinking weight like this, okay? So it's, it's sinking weight into the string without the thumb. I th that's just honestly the best I could come up with because this is that thing um, where it's like knowledge versus skill. Like you know the answer, you know you can't have too tight of a thumb, but then what, what does that feel like? If you can just feel it, <laughs> then you can change it. So that's what I would do, okay? You take this collapsed barbaric grip, dro drop the thumb off on purpose, Okay, I think actually one of my early, early, early videos um, ha talks about this little tip. It was kind of a quick thing I just uploaded because someone had a question about it. Um, but yeah, and you can, you just have your thumb off and you just kind of get used to, even with this kind of, I call it barbaric, but just this sort of rudimentary grip that's incorrect with finger placement. But I'm, I'm like very kind of just slapped onto the stick so it feels nice and weighty. Then I get used to sinking in without the thumb. Then I slowly add the thumb, but see if I can still keep that. And then eventually I take the right grip and see if I can do that. Okay. It is physics. I'm not a physician or <laughs> that's a doctor. I'm not a physics professor and I don't. So it's like, and I think we're going down the wrong road, even assessing it too much in that way because it really is more of like sensing the the weight and where it needs to be so it's it's a little bit less words and a little bit more just experimentation trying to sink weight in without activating the thumb too much okay i hope that helps give me a message if it doesn't because that's a that's a tricky one okay here's a quick question from linda how tight should the bow hair be that's a great question so Keep in mind, all bows are a little, a lot of bows are a little bit different. So you, you can't say, some people, I know people who used to like measure the distance between the hair, but depending, but depending on the curve of the stick, it doesn't necessarily look the same on each bow. So the, the biggest thing is you need this kind of gentle U shape is called, is one of the kind of cambers in the bow. Okay, so it's kind of like this kind of shape. You need to keep that camber. If you tighten the hair to the point where the bow is basically straight across, or even worse, if it's convex instead of concave, that's putting way too much pressure on the stick and you can break the bow. Like the, the, the wood can just snap. So that's the first rule of thumb, don't over tighten the bow. After that, it becomes a little bit subjective, but you basically, when you sink onto the string, you want to have a feeling that, you know, some sometimes if the bow hair is too loose, you just barely put your, you know, bow on the string and the stick's instantly touching the, you know, the hair. That's way too loose because if you try to sink in, you're just going to be scraping the stick of the bow into the string through the hair. Okay. Conversely, if you push down pretty hard and there's still tons of space, it's way, it's way too tight. Okay, so I, you just want it nice and flexible. I don't want it to feel like I have to really work to get the stick down, but I want it to be, you know, with my first finger as I flex it back and forth, 
it gets close to touching, but it doesn't touch. That's what I prefer. If you really nerd out and you just go on YouTube and check out, you know, top soloists and you see their bows and kind of how, how tight or loose you see all types of things. So it becomes just sort of a feeling, but those are the, you know, kind of general guidelines. All right, there you go. That's part two wraps up the 5K Q and A uh, video series I made. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I was such a treat to kind of interact with some of my subscribers who had questions. I have something even better planned for 10K. So uh, if you haven't already, please do subscribe and you know maybe even tell a friend about my channel if they're also an adult cellist or an adult string player. And um, really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you next week.